Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. Jim Dolan is Senior Director of Development for Illinois Joining Forces, IJF. Mr. Dolan joined the staff of IJF in the summer of 2016. He is responsible for assisting veterans and their families as they access community resources and for the statewide development of the Veteran Support Community, the VSC initiative. He has been a member of IJF since its inception in 2012 as the Executive Director of the Loris Foundation, and the co-founder of the Healer Warrior Initiative. Justin Miller served for nearly a decade in the U.S. Army and deployed twice to Iraq. Justin Miller separated from the service in January of 2013 and has been involved in the veteran network in and around the Chicagoland area ever since. Justin is currently the Transition Program Manager at the USO, managing the USO Pathfinder Program for the state of Illinois. As part of a 19-site network across the nation, the USO Pathfinder program provides a concierge-like approach to actively transitioning service members and their spouses and works with the National Guard Reserve service members at any time due to their inherent nature of being in the constant state of transition. Well, thank you so much for being here. Jim, Justin, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be able to chat with both of you. Jim, I, I usually like to throw this open to people by asking, what got you started in the work you're doing and what drives your passion? And if you would, uh, answer that a little bit and then toss it off to, to Justin. Sure, Tim, be happy to do it. Glad to be on with both of you. Probably uh, a dozen years ago, I was asked to be the executive director of a foundation called the Loris Foundation. And the mission of the Loris Foundation was to advance the lives of individuals with disabilities. Uh, our definition of disabilities was deliberately broad. It was uh, physical, mental, emotional, psychological, and developmental. And as we began to work with some pretty severe patients, spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, uh, we soon found out that those were the very same injuries that veterans were returning to, military personnel were returning with from combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. So began reaching out to the veteran community to share some of the learning that we had gained. And since we were a small startup, we tried not to compete with some of the other organizations that were working with veterans, and we looked to find alternatives. We worked with doctors who were specialized in nutrition, uh, in, in uh, chiropractic neurology, acupuncturists, equine therapists. We looked all, everywhere. And that kind of fueled my passion because we found out that a lot of the solutions that we were coming across were applicable for veterans and veterans were craving them. So that drove me to work more closely with veterans. Uh, in 2006, I joined Illinois Joining Forces as a staff member. Shortly after that, I got an opportunity to, to meet Justin, who works with uh, the USO. I am now the Senior D Director of Development for Illinois Joining Forces, and my task is to connect service members, veterans, and their families in the state of Illinois to the resources that they need and deserve. And Justin, in his position at the USO, does a similar thing with active duty. He can tell you more about that, but that's how our paths crossed. Uh, we became fast friends and have the same passion for serving service members, veterans, and their families. Justin? You hit the nail on the head, uh, Jim. I think we both have that similarity. Um, like Jim mentioned, you know, we're, we're both very aligned professionally. He has, again, that, that broader uh, catch-all for service members, veterans, or families. And the USO's Pathfinder program is the program that I'm currently manage, uh, is hyper-focused on that transitional time. Um, directly from leaving the service and entering civilian life. So we try to concentrate our resources around those that are still in, um, the, the programs and the advantages they can take, take of to do a successful transition out of the service, 
and then uh, give them those resources that they need to connect with their communities after they separate. Uh, and the great thing about our, our platform at the USO is that we have 19 sites across the nation. So for myself, you know, I left the service in 20, uh, 2010 active duty uh, and I returned um, here to Chicago after about seven years of being stationed in Georgia and a couple of tours to Iraq. So those folks at, at Fort Stewart, Georgia, really didn't have a lot of resources for me here in Chicago. Um, so it took that experience, my personal experience of transitioning home to a familiar place for me uh, before I was a veteran, but a very unfamiliar territory as a veteran, not knowing where all your resources are, not knowing who to talk to about your experiences and things like that. Um, having you know, a, a, a not so great transition myself, fueling that passion to, for what I do now. So that that's really where my passion comes from is is my own personal experience through transition, having that, that rough transition and looking back and saying, I wanna make sure that anybody that I come across that's in that transition phase, I can help um, so they don't have to fall into the same pitfalls that I've, I've fell into and also learn how to dig out of. So that's kind of where my passion is coming from. All right, so how do people find out about the services that you and Jim offer? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think that's, if we can answer that, that's the, that's the golden question, right, Jim? Um, yeah. For us at the USO, I mean, we benefit greatly by being a very uh, well-known brand when it comes to the military. Um, I knew about the USO and my, my, they call it day zero when you enter the service and you go to the airport and the first thing you look for is a familiar you know, USO Center to help direct you to wherever your flight's going to be when you're, when uh, you're young and going right into the service. Um, and then I knew the USO when I was deployed uh, and then also returning, you know, in those airport services. So that, that brand familiarization really helps tie in all those visits to, hey, when are you separating? We have a program that's designed to help you. Um, and so that's, that's ideally where we want to have people find us is through our, you know, our already well-known services that we, we serve those service members with. But you know, there, there isn't a hundred percent answer to that. Like we can't catch every single person leaving the service. There isn't an automatic email that goes out and says, hey, you need to check in with your USO Pathfinder program. So um, I think, you know, that's the, that's the tough nut to crack. We, we do our best through, you know, uh, familiar branding, I would imagine. With USO. So, but how do you, how does the Pathfinder program reach out to people? Yeah, so, so here in Illinois, we, we actually, um, you know, our case managers are also do a lot of outreach. So we'll, we'll go to events, we'll, we'll go support family days at reserve and guard units, let them know about our program. Um, I tend to brief the transition assistance classes that are mandatory, the DOD level. Um, Great Lakes, Naval Station Great Lakes, uh, right here in the area has those classes. Uh, you know, post COVID, those will be back into full swing, but generally speaking, once a month we go and we speak to those transitioning services, service members that are, that are leaving the service that have to go through that mandatory five day DOD training. So that's that's our you know best reach to those folks. So what so do you think? Go, to, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, for us, Tim, it's uh, we have a similar challenge. We don't have the brand recognition of USO. We're a statewide organization. Illinois Joining Forces is a public-private partnership. So it's all it's just like any other company, any other enterprise. Marketing what you do is the key to get the word out there. You know, education and awareness. One of the things that both Justin and I do, and I think we do pretty well, is partner with other organizations. Um, in our case, we have a, what we call a ground game or a ground campaign where we go into the communities. We call it the Veteran Support Community Initiative. We meet with folks who are doing this work. And, and that's the other thing, Tim. There are people who have been toiling in the fields for years, serving veterans in their local communities. Uh, with very little recognition, and they just do it because they're passionate about it, uh, both civilian and veterans themselves, reaching back and helping other veterans. So through our partnerships with other organizations, and there are some known organizations, the, the American Legions, the VFWs, the Illinois Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA itself, we work with all of them to connect the dots and nationwide, this is an initiative that has been finally figured out is that the best way to deliver services is at the community level. And the only way to make that happen is to get into the community, get to know people, develop relationships and trust, and begin to communicate with one another. So this is not just a single initiative for this year. This is a plan 
that other states are adopting to be able to do this permanently. We need to be able to have a system in place so that the next time we deploy 250 or 400,000 troops, when they come back, we know what we're doing and we know how to take care of them. Um, to your point, Jim, uh, this isn't something that we can do overnight, Tim. You know, this is, this is something that I, I personally have been developing my veteran community here for uh, just about a decade now, you know, and, and Jim about the same time, showing up to the community events, making sure people know who you are, you know, being passionate about serving that community and then finding yourself in a position to actually help serve them. Um, you know, for me, it's been a 10 year mission, passion, you know, uh, timeline to get where I'm at and to be recognized at these events and trusted by people to say, hey, I've got someone that really needs your help. I'm going to put you guys in touch because I know that you're going to take care of them. And, and, and same goes for Jim and IJF. Not something you can develop overnight, but certainly something that if you're passionate about, it's and Tim, I, I should have said at the very beginning, I, I am not a veteran. I'm a civilian. My dad served in World War II, um, so I have that in my blood. I didn't realize that I had grown up in a military family and still, until I started working with veterans and I recognized the traits. Um, but civilians play an incredible role in this. Uh, one in particular is there's just more of us. Less than 1% of the, the population serves in the military. So if we leave it to just the military or the government, we're lost. Uh, in fact, when we go out into the community, we quote Lincoln from his second inaugural, where he said that we are to bind up the nation's wounds. We are to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. And when he said those words, we don't think that he was talking about a federal bureaucracy. He wasn't talking about the federal government. He was speaking then, and we think he's speaking now through history to every citizen in every community in every state that we are to bind up the nation's wounds. We are to care for him who sh shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. So getting the civilians involved, getting them educated and connecting to them within the community is absolutely critical to this mission. Excellent. Well, you know, I I have the same situation as you, Jim. I have my father, my grandfather, my brother, my sister-in-law, uh, uncles in the military. I did not serve, um, but it's all through our family history. And um, one of the questions I had for you, Justin, is if if you've got this Pathfinder program and people find out about it a year before transitioning out, what's one of the biggest hurdles you have to get over to get the, the, the veterans themselves to engage your services? Uh, another million dollar question, Tim. Um, the biggest issue, the biggest challenge that we face is that transitioning service members, and this is true for anybody going through any type of transition in their life, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, really, that, that's what it comes down to. Most people just assume that whatever's in front of them is exactly what they need to know. Um, they can take that and run with it. Uh, but there are so many different facets to transition, especially leaving the, the military service, you know, that in, in order to process a tra transition successfully, you have to be able to dive into those different focus areas, address your VA benefits, address your employment, make sure that you're thinking about education, know that you have a VA home loan. I mean, these are just examples I'm throwing out, but there's, there's so many different facets to transition that a lot of people only get, you know, focused on employment. I got to get a job. You know, my paycheck's about to run out. I need to make sure I get a paycheck for my family. And that's well and good. That's obviously the top of the pyramid, right? But everything else underneath is a building block to that employment to make you sure you're stable in mental health. Make sure you have the education and the certifications to do the job or to get a job that you're skilled in. And all those things add up to that success. So, helping people understand that transition isn't just about one specific thing, whether that's employment or education, and there's multiple different areas that they need to make sure that they're, they're, they're taking care of and they're addressing is really important. It, it's a challenge for us to help them understand how important it is. Um, we're, we're doing better at that. I think, um, you know, it's, it's obviously easier to talk to somebody that's six months post separation, looking back and saying, man, I wish I would have done A, B, and C. Um, and so we tried to tell them now, before they leave the service, hey, A, B, and C are really, really important. Don't just look at A. Um, and so we're getting better at that through testimonials from past clients, um, from veterans that are you know, speaking to that same transitioning group saying, 
hey, I was in your place a year ago. I wish I had done this. So make sure you focus on that. And those are some of the tools that we can use to try to break down that barrier and, and make sure that people sign up for our services so we can, we can help them through their transition. Yeah, I would say that, Tim, from our angle, what we, what we see is very, very similar in that, uh, and there's a term within the military to understand your operational environment, right? So the operational environment, combat theater, the operational environment within the military is completely different than the operational environment in its civilians. Um, if I can take a second, one of the analogies that we use to talk about why it sometimes is difficult uh, is a bookshelf analogy. Um, Justin can tell you that in transition, if you start to reveal that you have issues, that can delay your transition and uh, your separation. So, um, frankly, some veterans just lie. They say, I'm not having any trouble. I'm not having any good difficulty. I'm a hard charger. I've always been a hard charger. I'm good to go. Um, the other reason is that they don't know yet that they may be having some issues. Um, so the bookshelf analogy is really pretty simple. The, the books lay on the shelves and there are bookends that keep the books upright. And the bookends represent the structure within the military. You're told where to be, what to wear, what to eat, where to go. All of your decisions or most of your decisions are being made for you, right? So that structure holds the books, holds the veteran or the military personnel, holds them together a little bit, right? That structure is important, structure and discipline. So when they transition out, those bookends are taken away, right? And for a period of time, those books are going to remain upright. But as the everyday stresses of life, as um, all of the decisions that they now have to make begin to multiply and add to that stress, the bookshelf gets shaken and all of a sudden the books start to fall apart. So it can be that they didn't lie when they left the military, but they hadn't realized that they were struggling because they, that structure was still in place. The books were still upright, but life has a tendency to hit us in all directions. So making sure that veterans are prepared for that, that they understand what the operational environment is gonna be when they get back into the civilian life and to connect to organizations right away like USO, and then connect to a state organization like Illinois Joining Forces helps to ease that transition. The DOD is starting to get better at it, but they still don't connect as well into the community uh, as they should. And every veteran is gonna return to some hometown somewhere. That's where they need to get connected to their community. If I can uh, just add on to that, Jim, I think, you know, from a personal perspective of leaving the service, you know, the mentality is very mechanical when you're in the, in the service, you know, you don't think to take care of yourself in, in all the full spectrum of ways that you need to take care of yourself. You just say, am I in the right uniform? Am I showing up the right time? You know, am, am I taking care of the people that I'm responsible for? Um, and am I good to go so my superior can, you know, can check that box? It's very mechanical in that way. And you don't, you don't think about, am I okay? You know, what does that mean to me being okay? Well, you know, for me, it just means being in the right uniform, but there's so much more to that question if you ask yourself. Um, and you don't start discovering that conversation in your head until once you're out of the service. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, it was, it was years afterwards, um, you know, and I, I don't necessarily regret it because now I'm able to take those experiences, turn around and help other people where if I didn't have those pitfalls. I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. Um, but I can definitely tell you that, you know, it's, it's a transition period. It takes time to start asking yourself that question and giving yourself an actual full, real answer. Am I okay? Um, if, if I'm not okay, is it okay to be not okay? Um, which is kind of that, you know, hope for the day model of mental health. Uh, and then I, I preach quite often because I'm, I have experience in that. Now you mentioned hope, hope for the day. And that's yeah. uh, Johnny Boucher out of Chicago. That's Johnny his Boucher. motto. Right. Yeah. And, and so just to highlight for people that Johnny was a person who had, I don't know, nine or 10 people in his circle of friends commit suicide. And um, he decided we got to do something about this. And so they yeah. just try to raise awareness. And uh, Justin, you just quoted their their motto. It's OK not to I be wear it okay. on my wrist every day. Right. Um, Perfect. Because I ask myself <clears throat> this question because their motto is just so poignant to 
not only to service members, but everybody, but their Project Red really focuses on the veteran. And, you know, it's funny, their offices are next door to my offices. So when we're, when we're not dealing with COVID and working from our basements, I get to see Johnny Boucher once in a while, which is really great. Um, but that question, it's okay, or that statement, it's okay, it's, it's okay not to be okay, you know, really resonates, I think, specifically with veterans that have to ask themselves that question and start giving themselves real answers well after the bookends are taken off. Well, right. and, and, and we want to open up the conversation because, you know, when you start looking at the numbers, the numbers of veterans that take their own lives is just staggering. Yeah. And, and that, that, that happens and, and grows in the secrecy. Yes, yeah. well, I'll, I'll uh, share a story with, uh, that I learned from Doc, a, a Vietnam veteran. Um, it has as much to do with the civilian population, our, the communities, our culture, as it does with the veterans themselves. The, uh, suicide is not, it's not uh, relegated just to the veteran community. It's, it's an epidemic, a pandemic as, as, as bad as COVID, right? It's, it, people are taking their lives in, in horrifying numbers across the globe. Um, and part of it, we've talked about post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. This veteran uh, served in Vietnam and about 35 years after he returned, he got a call from a doctor um, asking if he re uh, remembered or recognized his name. He was Vietnamese and this veteran, Doc, had, was embedded in his home when he was in Vietnam. And when the Vietnamese doctor came over, he wasn't a doctor then, he was a young kid and he came over went through, got his education, and swore that he would track down uh, this veteran, and he did. And he asked him if he'd like to go back to Vietnam with him. It was the first time he'd been back in almost 40 years. Uh, and he did go back, and it was cathartic for him. It was a transition in his entire life. He's been back over a dozen times now, and he's brought back veterans with him so that they could have, if they were willing to go, they could have the same experience, that healing experience. And one of the things that Doc said when he was talking about this experience of going back to Vietnam is that the people in Vietnam, the citizens there were not experiencing the level of PTSD or the severity of PTSD as much as the veterans from Vietnam who returned to America were because they had a shared experience. They had experienced the trauma of war on their own land and they had done it in a way where they could relate to one another. And you, tr and you contrast that with our society where we're more concerned than anybody else, right? And all that other stuff, it's just trivializes. So when they come back, there's not that shared experience. So educating the community as to what warfare is like, like I said, there's only one, less than 1% that serve. That makes a complete, that makes a big difference when someone comes back after experiencing war and the trauma of war. Uh, but I thought it was just an incredible insight that Doc shared that the people in Vietnam were dealing with it differently because of that principle of shared experience. They were able to relate with one another, sh um, sh support one another. Uh, they were peers to one another. And that's one of the initiatives that we're trying to put forth is to train more veterans to be peers to one another and to train the community members to recognize what the military culture and the and the the military experience is all about it's it's right on point that you mentioned that story jim because that's it's more or less how i started with my own mental health you know asking myself that question am i okay and giving myself an actual real answer and then doing something about it um, it really all started after i read the book tribe by sebastian younger he's a, a combat journalist um, never served in the service, um, but was probably overseas more than the average um, service member or soldier, um, just documenting the history of the wars. Um, and, and he compares and contrasts today's, um, you know, today's wars with uh, the American Indian and how they went to war as a tribe, the entire tribe moved to the front lines and experienced that together, exactly what you're talking about, Jim, um, with the Vietnamese people. And when I read that, that was the first time, you know, it, it, I, I, should, I should also mention that he, he talks in the book about coming home to a society 
that doesn't recognize their challenges, their struggles, um, you know, any of the, um, the, the real you know, issues they're dealing with as they trans transition back into this society where everybody's buried in their smartphones um, and very you know, disconnected, um, with, even though we're incredibly connected with the internet now and all of our devices, we're even more disconnected as human beings. Um, and then I'm reading this book. It's a very short book, so I, I, I highly recommend it to everybody um, and watch his YouTube. He's got a TED Talk. I, I'm reading this book, and I'm realizing that all the issues that I'm dealing with as a transitioning service member post-transition are almost actually normal, according to this book. You know, this is something that I'm, ex I'm experiencing right now. Um, and before reading that book, I thought it was I thought it was my problem. You know, I thought it was like something that, okay, I need to go fix because this is abnormal. And you read this book, and you read these, this, this historical telling uh, and this experience that they have. And it's like, wow, that's me. And that, that's, and that's normal. That's okay to come home, you know, from, from war and experience life differently because nobody else around me understands that because they haven't been and they haven't experienced it. They've only seen it, you know, through the, through the eyes of CNN, you know, or, or, or global news, but, they haven't seen it from my experience and nor do I want to burden them with my stories. Um, so realizing that everything that I was feeling wasn't abnormal, you know, quote unquote, but um, I started seeking help for that. And I started, I started, you know, talking to my, my veteran peers about these same things like, Hey, do you experience this, this disconnect, you know, with everybody around you that isn't a veteran that doesn't understand the language you speak? come to find out that, 99% of my student veteran chapter, that's what, as soon as I left the service, I went right into my education, you know, and being surrounded by, by student veterans, um, that experience, you know, was shared by everybody around me, even though I didn't really know it until I asked the question. And that gave me strength to seek help uh, with us mental health, finding new ways to address those, those questions and, and finding a, a good answer to the, is, am I okay question. Um, right. So that, okay. that has been my core experience. So it. Justin, give us the, the book title again and the author, please. Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Excellent. And yep. he has a TED Talk as well, Sebastian Younger. He's got a Younger. TED Talk. I saw that first. I immediately went out and bought the book. Um, you can read it on a two and a half hour, three hour flight. Um, I did that multiple times. I've, the, one, the copy that I have has lots of notes in it, but um, it, is, it is a great short book. Uh, and I, I really, I recommend it for, especially for civilians that don't understand service members and the transition and the experience that they have, it really helps give you insight to that, so. Well, and as a professional, lots of professionals that study this work, we know that the actual trauma is one thing. What's traumatic for one person may not be very traumatic for another, but one of the things we know that amplifies the effects of trauma is just what you're talking about. If the environment I'm in doesn't recognize, then it's I, it can be re-traumatizing every day. I have to go out and pretend that nothing happened. Jim, what'd you pull up? Yeah, well, that's uh, I, Justin. I'm so glad you mentioned this book. I'm going to hold it up. Um, this is the this is uh, if you're going to read any book about the war experience, and there are others, but this is the one to read. So. Um, and, and what he does is he gives kind of a, a lesson in history too, right? So we've been doing this to one another for eons, right? We've, we've been at war. Human beings just tend to do it. And uh, so the Greeks knew. Justin mentioned the Native American culture. Um, in the Native American culture, you could not return to the village immediately after a battle you had to go through a ceremony you had to go through a ritual so you once the battle was over you were taken out into the fields with the elders you would go on a hunt for weeks at a time you'd be able to decompress relax you'd be eating what you had hunted you, and the elders would be telling stories they they would share it and at a point certain they would be brought back into the village with ceremony and ritual so that they could cleanse from the experience and be welcomed back as, as uh, to take off their war feathers and to take off their, the war paint and to be welcomed back as father, uncle, brother, and husband. Um, in, in our culture, because as, as Justin said, we think we're connected, we're really not. We're more, more fractured as a society, as a culture than we've ever been. 
and making sure that we understand that you have to be able to make that transition into becoming a civilian again and allow the veteran to go through that process. Right now, you could be in Afghanistan and 48 hours later, you could be shopping for diapers in the Walmart. That just doesn't work. So part of it is the speed with which we expect people to get over it, snap your fingers, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, shake it off, all that crap. And that's part of the military culture too. You know, Justin can tell you, there's no whining when you're in the military, right? Yeah. So being able to recognize that you have these needs and that it's okay to talk about them and to go through a process. Our culture does not have a process. We don't have the, the education or the means or even the, sometimes the temperament to be able to listen to the stories that need to be told so that these transitions can be made. So you couple you couple that whole experience or that you know that struggle with the uh, what you said, Jim. You know, there's no there's no room for whining in, in the military. You, you're wired to not complain. You're wired to not you know worry about the small things. Um, and then you associate that with mental health. Oh, well, if I'm having a mental health struggle, I can't whine about it. I can't address it. I need to. I just need to power through it. And so you have that mentality entering in this transition struggle, and it just really makes for uh, not a healthy uh, mindset, um, you know, and, and, and it really, you know, at the end of the day, a struggle going through that transition, trying to find your own way. Um, you know, my, my, I, was, I was very lucky that I had found a student veteran group um, right when I left the service that kind of kept me going. Um, and surrounded myself with my tribe. That was my tribe. And funny, I'm actually using the mug here, the BMRC. You know, that was my tribe when I exited the service. And I was lucky enough to have that. And I still struggled through my transition. So if I was lucky enough to have my tribe with me and still going through those same struggles, I can't imagine what some service members is feeling when they're leaving the service and they're exiting into a community that they, that they don't have a tribe with them. Again, case in point, why I do what I do today. So now you layer on top of that, Tim, the isolation that's resulted from COVID, right? Where we're separated from one another. Um, that's causing a tremendous amount of stress on the veteran population. And, and I don't wanna be monolithic. There are veterans like Justin who have transitioned, even though they had struggles, they're doing, they're doing well. He's doing an outstanding job reaching back and serving other veterans. Uh, but there are quite a few that do struggle and this isolation that occurs is contributing to an increase in veteran suicide uh, and suicide across the board. Uh, we're social beings. We're not designed to be isolated one from another. So um, one of the things that uh, to get back to what Justin and I do on a daily basis is to make sure that we're uh, listening to make sure that we're getting the word out about uh, the resources that are available, both behavioral health resources and every other type of resource. Um, sometimes we overcomplicate this, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes into play in a big way. Um, we have a call center, so I'll do our IJF commercial. Uh, I'll let Justin do the same. Uh, we have two combat veterans that man the phones at our care coordination center. That number is 833-INFO-INFO, INFO-IJF, 833-INFO-IJF, 463-6453. Any veteran, family member, caregiver, or survivor can call that number and we will connect them to the resources. And the interesting thing, Tim, is that only about 20 to 25% of the requests that we get have anything whatsoever to do with military service. The other 75 to 80% of the requests are everyday stuff, right? How do I pay my mortgage? How do I pay my rent? How do I pay for food? How do I get my kids into college? What do I do if my car breaks down? Um, so we, you don't need to be a trained psychologist or psychiatrist to be able to provide solutions to those kinds of problems. And that's where the community comes into play. If somebody's car breaks down and they're unable to get to work because they can't afford to fix the car and they lose their job, 
pretty soon things start to spiral out of control. So a little bit of intervention, a little bit of assistance at the right time can make a tremendous amount of difference. You, some people who don't leave a note about why they took their lives, if you examine their stories, there's a way back to a point where things started to unravel. Um, that's why we want to be proactive to make sure that we're getting people the assistance they need before things do start to unravel. Yeah, I mean, for us, we want to try to uh, proactively engage those service members so they don't, um, you know, leave the service with housing issues and financial issues and things like that. So, and at the end of the day, we can't help every single person because a lot of people don't reach out for help until it's too late. But if we can, if we can, you know, impact the lives of two to 300 veterans, you know, every year through our program, then that's perhaps two or 300 veterans that don't have to go to IJF. Um, so they can focus on the folks that have, you know, serious needs and needs to be addressed. So we talk about financial readiness. We talk about, you know, housing and, and, and legal, um, you know, what are you going to do uh, after you leave the service to have a paycheck? And is just your education line up with that employment that you want? You know, we, you know, I, I'm glad that my team is comprised of myself as a combat veteran, you know, Mike Bauman, who's a combat medic. We were both in the army. And then we have a military spouse on our team, Megan Philpott, um, and her husband's an active duty Navy um, recruiter. We pride ourselves on having that background so we can speak to, to spouses and we can speak to, you know, transitioning service members and sometimes help them set, you know, more realistic expectations. Um, I hate to say it, but a lot of service members will leave the service uh, kind of with that, that sense of entitlement. You know, I'm, I'm a veteran. I, I'm going to walk right into middle management. You know, I don't really need a, you know, a four-year degree. And, you know, we have a conversation with them and like, hey, the civilian world is very different. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you're credentialed to do it, you know, in the eyes of corporate America or whomever you want to walk in and have a job with. You got to get you got to get that four year degree. You got to make sure that you you have a budget now because your life is going to be different. You know, Uncle Sam is no longer going to be paying for your housing allowance and your food allowance and all these other things. Well, and, and that's a, the, the, the point that you're making is that so many of our veterans went in so young, they didn't have time out in the civilian world to develop all those skills that most of us slog our way through through our 20s, you know, gaining Absolutely. bits of knowledge here and there. Listen, uh, let me ask, Jim, before we started uh, recording, you were talking about some questions that were posted on a Facebook group. I want to make sure we have some time to have you address some of that. You said some of those people responded with some wonderful answers. And I think that that's the key, Tim, is to make sure, and I think that Justin and I do it, uh, I think we're learning to do it better, is to listen to the veterans. Instead of um, thinking that we have all the answers, not every veteran's experience is the same, right? There, it's, not a diff it's not just some are heroes and some are broken, right? It, it runs the spectrum. Uh, the Vietnam era experience is different uh, than the post 9-11 experience. So listening to the veterans is incredibly important. One of our great partners that Justin and I work with here in Chicago is Chicago Veterans. It's a large organization, uh, really kind of homegrown where they just began to come together. They have a Facebook page. It's chicagovets.com is their website. Any veteran in the Chicagoland area should know about them, get connected to those veterans. So on their Facebook page, the, this question was uh, posed just by another veteran. And the question is, what do you think holds most veterans back from living their ideal life after serving? Um, and there's, there are quite a few answers. Um, Justin was able to relate to most. Uh, as a veteran, I was able to relate because I had heard these answers before. But one of them that was most telling was the, actually the very last one, Justin. Um, and I'll read it for you. It says, I believe that for most, they don't even know what their ideal life is. Their identity is wrapped up in the uniform, and they don't know who they are when they're not wearing it. There is a loss of purpose when we leave. Couple that with MST, military sexual trauma, PTS, post-traumatic stress, an identity crisis, and you have the perfect storm. Life has to have meaning and purpose, or it's not worth living. That is your root cause, both for living your ideal life and for preventing suicide. So that was written by a veteran. 
uh, Nathan wrote that. It's the, the last one that was on the post. And I think it summed up most of what others shared as well, that there's a loss of identity, a loss of purpose, and purpose and direction are absolutely critical. And, in, and I think that with USO, they begin to, as they grab a hold of the veteran, they begin to show them you can have purpose and direction after you take off this uniform. Your identity is not wrapped up in what you once were or what you once wore, but it's based on what you want to do and what animates you, what your purpose is. And I, th I think the key is to make sure that we as a society recognize the military culture and afford people the opportunity to find purpose and direction again. Well, and there are some wonderful ways for people to build a sense of purpose. Um, we should talk about that in, in another um, interview because it, if you have some structure, I mean, people say, how do I find my purpose? Well, there are people who studied that. And I could name three right now that we'll, we'll talk about in our next interview that we can make these resources available to people. How do, you, how do you figure out what my purpose in life is or could be? How do I build one? Some people build their purpose based on trying to help other people get through their, their worst trauma. Some people build their purpose based on the things they love to do and the things they're naturally good at. So we'll talk about that another time. Do you well, want I, to I comment, Justin? I, I, before Justin weighs in, I think that, um, and I'll just point to him, um, and, and there isn't just a single answer to it. As you said, Tim, it re would require an entire other conversation. But one of the things that Justin, and you can, you can tell me if I'm wrong, Justin, but the, in the military, there's a service ethos, a service ethic. And I would venture to say that Justin's progress, Justin's success is the result of his service, his servant's heart. He has begun to serve others, which has given him purpose and direction. Um, and that's one thing that veterans should never forget is that they were trained to serve and there are opportunities to serve again that can lead to that ideal life. Yeah, I mean, um, for me personally, I was able to luckily fall into my student veteran chapter uh, through Student Veterans of America at, at my undergrad, during my undergrad program, you know, they, they were in need of leadership. Uh, I was fresh off the boat, as they say. Um, so I had, you know, droves of leadership still uh, on, with, with my stripes. Um, so I walked in as, a, as the NCO that I knew I was and said, I, I can lead this group. You know, this is, this is a task that I'm willing to stand up uh, for. And that, that became a passion, that leadership, you know, serving my fellow veterans uh, in a different way, because now we're in the civilian world, um, became my passion and that drove me. But for, we talk about purpose. For me, you know, it, trying to find purpose in, in a couple of different ways, in a couple of different facets of life um, is is daunting, especially when the military gives you purpose from day one. <laughs> you raise your hand, you say an O, and now you have purpose, right? And so when you leave the service, you need to find purpose again. For me, I Googled purpose. How do I find my purpose? Um, I, I came across this, <laughs> I know, right? Um, why yeah. not? Um, I, I came across this purpose Venn diagram. It's got four circles. Um, you know, the top circle is what you love doing. Uh, the left circle is what you are good at. The, the south circle is what you can be paid for. Uh, and then the last circle is what the world needs. And you, so you take those four questions and you Venn diagram those four circles to where they meet right in the middle. And a couple that overlap will you know, give you profession. A couple that overlap will give you passion. A few that overlap will give you mission. And a few that overlap will give you vocation. But if you can really find the center of all four of those where they cross over, that's purpose. Um, and so what I did is I printed out that Venn diagram. Uh, I'm again, a bit, that very mechanical thought process, you know, from the military is still uh, with me today. And I, I love it because I'm, I'm very in tune with it. But I, I, I printed that out and I put a dot where I thought I was at the time. And so I knew from right where that dot is in the out, one of the outside circles that I'm definitely, you know, figuring out. Where do I need to go to get to that middle? You know, what other circles do I have to identify to, for myself? And those questions aren't easy questions to answer. They take time. 
And when you're in the military, you're used to answering questions very rapidly, right? You have very few decisions, but the decisions that you make in the military can sometimes be as, as important as life and death. Um, so you're, you're used to rapid decision making. And I will, you know, say to my fellow service members and veterans that are leaving the service, it's okay to take some time, you know, and, and, and journey through your life to figure out what your purpose is and start identifying things that you're good at, what you can get paid for, what you're passionate about, um, you know, and what the world needs. And that way you're solving things on multiple different levels. And it maybe makes that journey, you know, of purpose a little bit easier. Um, that's my two cents anyways. Excellent. That's perfect. Excellent. Well, l let me ask you, Jim, I know you have to go. Um, closing comments or questions, some things that are popping into your head that, oh, we should mention this before we wrap this up? The word is hope, right? That's what people need first. Um, when we deal with some of the younger docs um, that we've de dealt with in the past, trying to deal with veterans who are struggling, um, sometimes they think, well, you don't want to give them false hope. And we're like, wait a minute, that you, hope is the very first thing that you give people, right? There are no, and people are smart enough to recognize that they can hold two thoughts in their head at the same time. There are no guarantees, but there's always hope. And so connecting to other veterans like Justin and the group, Chicago veterans and others who have had their struggles, who have been able to transition um, will give you hope. So my mantra would be get connected. Um, sometimes the military, they forget their training. Nobody does this alone. In the military, that's the very first thing you're taught, right? So it, the same is true in the civilian life. Don't go it alone. Connect to people so that you can learn from them, so that they can support you and you can support them. Uh, but the mantra is hope. There is always hope. Well, I need to add to that because uh, as somebody who's been doing therapy for 46 years, I've been around long enough to know that we went through decades where people told us that if you had a trauma or a brain trauma, that's it for life. That's, that's that chronic, you're stagnant, and we just have to throw meds at you or warehouse you eventually. And over the last few decades, I've watched them develop phenomenal treatments for trauma. And I've had all kinds of people who'd had post-traumatic stress disorder and bipolar disorder and all these other things where they, when, they, when they're willing and they engage in proper tools, their life transforms and they're not warehoused and they're not on meds and they have a sense of purpose and value and joy in their life. So there is hope. And because we're human beings, we're designed specifically to heal and we can heal. Yeah, amazingly so. And if people are out there, if you're looking for some help, resources like, you know, Justin Miller at the USO and Jim Dolan at Illinois Joining Forces, but also if you're going for a professional, do what you can to find somebody who has integrative health as their title or functional health as their title or holistic functional medicine as their title, because those are people who are going to look at all kinds of resources from a whole perspective, seeing you as a system, as an individual, fitting into systems in your family, in your community, and you'll get far more benefits far more quickly dealing with those kinds of professionals. Amen. Well, I am going to invite you both back for another interview. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. I know you have to run, Jim, but uh, it's been a blessing. And um, we'll talk again soon, hopefully within the next few months. Well, Tim, before we do leave, um, I gave my commercial, 833-INFO-IJF, 833-463-6453 is how you can reach Illinois Joining Forces. Uh, Justin, if you want to go ahead and let them know how they can reach you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are currently in the service, uh, serving in the National Guard, reserves, a military spouse, um, very recently separated, that's that, that's that focus area we look at, that timeline. Uh, just go to uso.org slash pathfinder. You can find all of the information that you need. Um, I think uso.org slash transition also works. It'll bring you to the same landing page. Uh, but I, I guess ab above all else, if you're looking for help, seek help um, and have hope for sure, Jim. Um, and I will just say from a personal uh, personal perspective, I know it's, 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 a, it's a motto and it's kind of cliche, but it does ring true. It's okay not to be okay. Have hope. I mean, that is, that is the saying that rings true. I spent two years in, in doing um, outreach for road home program at Rush University Medical Center. 
um, and they specifically address mental health outpatient needs for veterans and their families. Um, so if you are listening to this and you need help, uh, you don't know where to go, you can call me, you can reach out to Road Home, you can, uh, you can reach out to IJF, you can reach out to any of these things and it's okay. You just pick up the phone and have a conversation um, and we will make sure that you get the help that you need. Excellent. We'll have the contact information attached to this blog and this uh, YouTube video. I, I honor you both and thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Pleasure. Tim. Thank you for what you do. Appreciate it, sir. Jim Dolan is Senior Director of Development for Illinois Joining Forces, IJF. Mr. Dolan joined the staff of IJF in the summer of 2016. He is responsible for assisting veterans and their families as they access community resources and for the statewide development of the Veteran Support Community, the VSC initiative. He has been a member of IJF since its inception in 2012 as the executive director of the Loris Foundation and the co-founder of the Healer Warrior Initiative. The Loris Foundation began in 2008 with the mission to advance the lives of individuals with disabilities with a focus on finding modalities that center on the body's remarkable ability to heal itself. Jim and Dr. Frank Urasik, Ph.D., founded the Healer Warrior Initiative, HealerWarrior.us, a self-health care training program teaching veterans to take better care of themselves, their families, and other veterans. Jim serves on the board of scientific and professional advisors for the National Center for Emotional Wellness, formerly the Institute for Traumatic Stress. Jim also serves on the board for Growing Healthy Veterans, a Lake County, Illinois-based nonprofit dedicated to helping veterans heal through farming, gardening, and agriculture, and to introduce them to the concepts of locally grown, sustainable agriculture for themselves and their families, and potential employment and career opportunities in that field. Prior to his work with veterans, Jim spent 20 years in the database business and applies this knowledge to build and access the many community assets and resources that military members, veterans, and their families need and deserve. Justin Miller served for nearly a decade in the U.S. Army and deployed twice to Iraq. Justin Miller separated from the service in January of 2013 and has been involved in the veteran network in and around the Chicagoland area ever since. Justin is currently the Transition Program Manager at the USO, managing the USO Pathfinder Program for the state of Illinois. As part of a 19-site network across the nation, the USO Pathfinder Program provides a concierge-like approach to actively transitioning service members and their spouses and works with the National Guard Reserve service members at any time due to their inherent nature of being in the constant state of transition. Mr. Miller serves on the board for Roll Call Chicagoland and has been a volunteer with the organization since its inception in 2017. He was selected into the communications chair role in 2018 and has most recently been selected to serve as vice chair of operations to further the organization's efforts of bringing together the military connected community to cultivate the professional network in the greater Chicagoland area. He also serves on the board for SVA Illinois, a regional model for the National Student Veterans of America organization, due to his firsthand experience as a student veteran. As the Director of Strategic Initiative, Justin helps the organization find new ways to support and sustain student veterans through their education here in Illinois by way of new programs, growth strategies, and staff expansion. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.